Say good to go. Carry out, we're good to go. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. The Committee of Adjustment meeting of March the 23rd, 2021 will come to order. Members of the public, staff, presenters, and members of the committee, please be advised that meetings are broadcast and recorded and made available on the internet. Is there any disclosure of pecuniary interest or the general nature thereof on any of these items? Please take note, Madam Clerk, that there were none. Uh, we don't have any deputations. So I will go now to our planner to announce the purpose of the meeting, Jeanette. Thank you. Uh, so the Committee of Adjustment is holding this public hearing in order to consider applications to provide relief from the Township Zoning Bylaw, which is Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 2009-021, in accordance with Section 45 of the Planning Act. The prescribed notice of public meeting was provided by a prepaid first class mail to all residents that were within a 60 meter radius of the subject properties, as well as by a sign being posted on the properties. The notice was also provided by email and fax to the prescribed ministries and agencies, and the notice was available on the township's website. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions um, at the public hearing or make a written submission to the township of Selwyn before the minor variances are approved, a person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Committee of Adjustment to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, nor can a person or public body be added as a hearing of an appeal before the LPAT, unless in the opinion of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. And so I can just move um, right to the first application if you'd like. Yes, please. So the application is A-41-20. The owner of the property is David James Evans, and the agent is Paul Putter. Uh, the property address is 2182 Cedarwood Lane in the Smith Ward. So the application is seeking relief um, from a, a few components of the zoning bylaw. So they're looking to increase the maximum height of an accessory structure, so a detached garage, from 4 meters to 4.95 meters. Um, they're looking to increase the maximum lot coverage of accessory structures from 5% to 5.9%. Um, they're also looking to decrease minimum size yard setback from uh, 10 meters to 3.1 meters. I uh, should note that the existing boathouse is at 4.3 meters. And then um, looking to a decrease the minimum setback from high water mark from 30 meters to 7.2 meters to a dwelling addition, from 30 meters to 13.6 meters to a covered porch addition, and as well as uh, 30 meters to 4.5 meters to a structurally non-permanent set. Uh, so the property owner is looking to do some improvements on the property, and, and this is um, why these variances are required. So the, um, there'll be a partial demolition of the existing dwelling with the construction of an addition, um, as well as a covered entryway and some new decking. Uh, the application is also looking uh, to uh, construct a garage with a height of 4.95 meters, um, and as well as to replace an existing boathouse. Um, and that boathouse will be expanded. Um, uh, so there's a bit of a reduction from uh, the existing side yard setback to 3.1 meters. Uh, so I have completed a review of the application, and I do believe um, that the general intent and purpose of the township's official plan and zoning bylaw have been maintained. Uh, the variance is desirable for the appropriate development to use of land, building, or structure, and the proposed variance is minor in nature. And I have recommended that the committee grant the variances. Um, we have received some additional correspondence um, in relation to this file. Uh, so we did receive comments from uh, MTO, the Conservation Authority, so ORCA, as well as Federal Public Health, who have no application. We also received some pu uh, public comments, which were provided um, as an attachment to, uh, to, to this report. Um, and the, um, the neighbor who had some concerns with the application does have somebody speaking on his behalf um, in, uh, in relation to this application. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. All right, thank you very much. Um, 
Deputy Clerk, I understand that the agent, Paul Hutter, is in attendance. Paul, do you have anything to add to this, um, what has been said? Run mute. I've got nothing to add, no. Nope. Right, thank you very much. There was no one else that was here in favor of the application, Deputy Clerk? No, that's it, just the agent. All right. And in opposition, I understand Ryan Edgar and Gary and Nancy Edgar are speaking against this application. Uh, can you please address us? Madam Chair, I believe that Ryan Edgar is in attendance. I don't believe uh, his parents, Gary and Nancy, are. Maybe uh, Ryan can clarify. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Edgar. That's correct. Uh, Charles Ryan Edgar, uh, also owner of property at 2178 Cedarwood Lane. That's the uh, property directly south of this property. Uh, and I will be speaking on behalf of my parents, Gary and Nancy Edgar, as well as my two siblings, uh, Andre Don Jackson and Aaron Lindquist. Go ahead. Okay, great. If, uh, if I can start, uh, thanks so much again to committee for, uh, for letting us speak to this uh, property. Um, our property has been... Uh, in the family since 1953. Uh, we have seen numerous changes to properties in the area, obviously, specifically from it being a, a recreational cottage, private laneway known as Cedarwood Lane to uh, what we know today as a year round unassumed roadway with uh, numerous new homes and all of those uh, old cedar trees being taken down for new development. But uh, coming from the municipal world myself, I understand that it's great to, to have the new development. Uh, in 1953, our current dock, which you don't see in the illustrations or you can't see um, and any of the topographical pictures that were presented uh, is still existing today. It was built by my grandfather with the approval from the Lake Authority um, at the time that the permanent structure uh, was, was built and remains in place today, unlike numerous concrete uh, docks that were built over the years. Um, it's never been torn away or moved when the ice comes out. It's, uh, it's home to natural spawning beds and is surrounded by a rock-free base, which is used by uh, kids of all ages uh, on the property and, and our adjoining properties to play and swim in the shallow waters. Since the Edgars arrived in 1953, that's our property. Um, basically our, our neighboring property at 2182 has been the cottage property of six different families since that time, including the applicant today. Uh, DJ's probably on the, on the call, um, you know, and he's the first, uh, first family to be in there and, and live on the property year round. Uh, the boathouse he wishes to enlarge and hopes to relocate um, was built, uh, the current structure was built in the 1960s when boats obviously were much smaller. And I know that for most of my entire life, uh, it housed an old Peterborough 16 foot vessel that I skied behind on numerous occasions. Um, I've had great discussion with both my parents and my siblings, all our owners of the property as to the proposed minor variance requests. And the good news is we are good with three of the four, but absolutely not the fourth. And the fourth is uh, point number three, as you spoke to the side yard setbacks. Um, as you're probably aware, there, uh, there does remain some discrepancies around the proposed drawing. Um, my father, fortunately, uh, is a retired road superintendent with the city of Oshawa, and he worked very closely with the Ontario Line Surveyor. Uh, they were out there this week as well as uh, yesterday to, uh, to look at the, the measurements, and I know that the building official is aware that there was a discrepancy to, uh, to what was uh, written in your document of the 4.3 and the 4.53. It's actually 16 feet, so it's, uh, it's over 4.87 meters, um, and those are changes that, uh, that we'll need to make as the, as the document moves forward. However, uh, in, front, uh, in front of the proposed structure, this is what I'm here to, uh, to show you a couple pictures today, uh, if for whatever reason that south property, that south wall on the, uh, on the current structure moves any further south, uh, we're going to have a, a bit of a, an issue, obviously, um, as the owners of the property will never be in a position to build a marine railway or access the front of their new boathouse, given the current situation, uh, as you'll see in my attached pictures. So um, if, uh, if it remains exactly where it's at, uh, no problem. They could get a marine railway and they'd be able to use that for future use, but uh, not if it's moved at all. Uh, my parents uh, aren't on the call because my dad is very passionate about this. Um, and, uh, and, and for his own health, I said, stay off, the, stay off the call. I said, I'll look after this. So bylaws are there to protect us. And although we don't want to see the new structure 10 meters from the property line, we certainly don't want to see it any closer than it, uh, than it is today. Um, the current requirements, as you knew, for new builds for, uh, for a, an existing or for a, uh, a new structure would be 10 meters. Um, and our, our concern really comes down to it's listed as a boathouse, uh, pool, 
or the uh, the pump house. But I, I understand from from what my my parents have advised that DJ has indicated it's it's not going to be used as a boathouse. It's going to be used more as a bunky, which leads me to get it might be used for entertainment, music, parties, even if not now, maybe for generations to come and those that acquire the property later down the road. Uh, however, with my uh, with my family, we have discussed that if it is committee that allows for uh, for the variances to go through, we do ask that it not be built. Uh, we know that it's not going to be built on the existing platform, um, which would be the way it would be if it was grandfathered. Um, However, we would ask that the southwest corner of the existing structure not be moved at all. And that's the one for your documents is listed at approximately 4.53 meters. We don't want to see that come any further south. And again, once I share my screen with you, we can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, however, if it is committee's decision to move forward with that, um, I have spoken with my parents and said, listen, in the municipal world, maybe we can be more amicable with an outcome or a solution. And we're suggesting that the requested change to 3.1 meters be be allowed on the southeast corner of the uh, of the new structure to be built and that would allow for an angle obviously that would take it uh into a an area where future owners could use it for for access for marine railway they could use it for you know a lift or something like that but uh certainly we don't want to see that change so um, I have a couple of questions of, of council afterwards, but I, I'd like uh, the request to share my screen if possible. Thank you, Clark. Sure, yeah, we can do that. Just give me one second here. Thank you very much. Okay, you should be good to go. Great, thank you so much. And I'm just going to share the screen here with you. So what I've shown here is a very basic picture that was taken yesterday. You'll see that the ice is still on in Lake Shimong. Uh, and in the picture, uh, you will see just in the top end, let me make it a little bit, I'm going to focus, zoom this in just a little bit easier for you. Perfect. Uh, and in this property, you'll see the, the new property markers that are in there. And this is the current south side of the, uh, of the existing structure. Again, it's just a small little uh, boathouse that was in there for years. Um, but what you can't see necessarily is right in behind this tree. So what I've done is just to move this, uh, this picture forward, you'll see that this is the line. This is a picture taken yesterday looking straight down the south wall of the boathouse. Uh, and if that boathouse is to go any further to the south, what will happen is that private bay that was, uh, you know, owned by four properties back in the 1950s through through to today, um, that area obviously is, is going to have a huge obstruction for users of that uh, of that new boathouse. So what we're suggesting and what we're requesting is that, that this front corner, the southwest corner, uh, not be changed. Uh, and that obviously the new angle would come down uh, towards that 3.1 meters uh, off the, uh, the side yard setback itself. Um, I just I, I wanted to throw that picture out because I think this best illustrates the issue uh, that they're going to have for any future use of this building. Uh, they may not use it for Marine Railway now. They may not use it for for any docks to go out there. And maybe they're simply just using it as uh, as, a, as a dock uh, or as a boathouse bunky. Um, great. But uh, these are where our concerns are at right now. So, again, we'd be uh, we could, we would be agreeable as a family to have that southwest corner remain in place and uh, DJ go forward with uh, with his new development and use it for whatever purpose. Um, my parents did have the question with respect to a, a, a bunky. They've looked into it in the past uh, through oceans and fisheries. And because our current boathouse is on our property, um, if we wanted to do a change of use as a boathouse and switched it over to a bunky, we want to make sure that that a um, that whatever we're, we're putting forward today as, as a committee today is actually being used for that purpose. If it's a boathouse, it's a boathouse. If it's a bunky, um, then obviously we want to make sure that it's it's known as a as a bunky. Um, but we certainly don't want to see any changes that are going to take away from that awesome recreational space that we have in the in the protected areas of the water. Um, my parents want to also have a bunky in their property. That's something that they'll probably be coming forward, you know, at some point of changing our existing boathouse over to a bunky as well. But uh, we've got new development on both the south and the north sides of the property that will happen in the next year. And I just want to make sure that my parents uh, can continue to enjoy the use of their property that they've used as their cottage property since uh, since the 50s. So um, I uh, 
I open that up to any questions that you may have of me. But uh, that's our that's our biggest hiccup right now is obviously not wanting to see that south uh, south wall change in the uh, in the variance itself. Right. And have you had discussion with the applicant? Uh, I believe my father has. Uh, he's obviously spoken with the building official over the discrepancies itself, but. DJ and I will be neighbors, you know, as long as he stays there for years to come. And uh, and I still would say that that we're friends. We're completely amicable that way. However, it's not necessarily what DJ is going to use it for. It's going to be what the future use may be if if they decide to move on and such. So um, okay. that's our that's our request. All right. Thank you, um, Jeanette. Did you take note of the questions? Yeah, so um, I, so I guess uh, to start with the, the notion of this becoming a bunkie, that would not be permitted. Um, this is a boathouse and there's no habitable space um, permitted within a boathouse. Um, also, it is located within the floodplain, so it, it can be there because it is a boathouse and it, um, it has a connection to the water. Um, but no, there wouldn't be um, any opportunity for this to become something else. Um, as it relates to uh, the discrepancy that um, that uh, Mr. Edgar is speaking to, um, there there were a couple of different um, reiterations of site plans that were provided to the municipality, and the wrong one was attached to um, to the notice. So the actual measurement from the survey of the existing structure. That we lost you. Jeanette, you're muted. Sorry. Okay. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to identify that the existing survey that was completed by an OLS does provide, um, does indicate that the setback is 4.3 meters, which would equal uh, 14 feet. The applicant is asking to reduce that to 3.1 meters or what would be equal to 10 feet. Um, Mr. Hutter may be able to speak to this, uh, but uh, what um, my understanding is, is that the existing marine railway, um, that it may be improved, but it will not be moved. So the, so if there's no conflict today, there shouldn't be a conflict um, even with a larger um, boathouse. Mr. Hutter? Oh, th that's right. There's no plans to replace the existing railway other than to improve it, but the location stays exactly where it is. Okay. Is there anything else, Jeanette? No, I think I think I caught everything unless I, I missed something. I think those were the two the, the two major points um, that the applicant was concerned about or that the um, striker was concerned about. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, was there anyone else that had called in a deputy clerk with uh, that was in opposition to this application? We have no one else here for this application, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to bring it to committee. Are there any questions, Anita? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, so Mr. Edgar was saying um, in terms of citing the boathouse, um, and I can't remember if he said southeast or southwest. But it sounded to me like um, where the original point is, um, he's suggesting that stays, but then the rest of it kind of tilts as opposed to tilting it the other way. Um, Jeanette, can that um, be part of the site plan requirement? Or um, so rather than it's sitting this way, I, I'm taking it would sit this way a little well, bit. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at the at the site plan that was provided by Mr. Hutter, um, they're looking actually um, that it that the it'll run parallel with the lot line. So it'll be at 3.1 meters or 10 feet from the side lot line. It'll run parallel with it. Right now, the way the boathouse is, it's closer out. Uh, it's closer to the point that's closest to the water. It's actually it it's at 4.5 meters, and then the the point that is further back from the water is at 4.3 meters. So it will actually be rotated um, better. Um, it's not going to be on a, I, I guess for lack of a better word, a flat, it's slant, it's still gonna run, it, it'll run parallel with the lot line. It'll just be closer by four feet. Donna. Yes, through you to um, Mr. Edgar. So when you were showing your pictures, your photograph, um, it looked to me like you were 
okay with the but to keep it 4.3 at the water, but tilt the back of it back to the 3.1, is that what you were proposing? That's uh, that's correct, uh, Ms. Valentine. It, uh, when we look at it right now, the picture was taken two feet off that wall so that you could see that any shift of that south wall, four feet as requested by the applicant, if for whatever reason they do in the future decide to put a new marine railway in or use it for a dock or whatever, they're never going to be able to bring the boat comfortably out of their marine railway and out into the water. They'll have to angle it the other way. I've been on that water my entire life. And uh, right at the end of the boathouse, uh, you're in about 12 inches to 14 inches of water at best. So what, what we're saying as a family is we would be completely agreeable to having that southeast corner of the new structure uh, come over to 3.1 meters. But as it shows in the picture, and again, I know it says 4.53. My, uh, my father has said he will meet with the building official again to ensure that even yesterday when they measured it uh, with the, uh, the true end of the, of the measuring tape, it was at 4.877 meters. And that's using the new stakes that were put in by uh, Ontario Land Surveyors. Uh, he's worked with them greatly, so he'd be happy to meet with them. But again, the request is at 4.53 meters, uh, for the southwest corner of the uh, new structure and 3.1 meters, 3.11 meters of the uh, new southeast corner of the structure itself. So that would create an angle, obviously, that would turn the doors, doorways away from the current line of sight, any future obstructions, uh, and, our, and our family would absolutely have no, no uh, problems with this. And uh, it would certainly help us from without going to the, uh, the appeal process. Yes, Donna. I believe that this is a reasonable compromise from the neighbors. Uh, they're still getting part of um, the Evanses are still getting part of what they wanted. Only I understand being living on the lake my whole life as a younger person, the the types of problems that the shorelines create and the different docks. So I would be in favor of supporting that condition that Mr. Edgar has, has put forward. All right, thank you. Andy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Mr. Edgar, I just wanna make sure I understand this correctly. So what you're trying to do is to make sure that the orientation of the front of that boathouse, and, and I'm not gonna get it exact, so, so forgive me, rather than uh, being uh, easterly, will end up being more northeasterly. Is that correct? That is correct. So the, uh, the angle obviously would be for any future use, would be away from the current trajectory, which faces right now, right into the, uh, the existing dock. Um, which is which is rock bed. It's uh, it's built on gabion baskets. Won't obviously be moved, but the future use would be able to use that for marine railway purposes, for docks, whatever whatever they choose to use. If they're not using it for uh, for entertainment purposes. So the base. So what you're what you're suggesting is if the if if the if the variance brings it four feet, which would be to the south, and if you keep the orientation the way it is right now and you exit that boathouse, you will come in conflict with the dock. That is correct. If you swing it so that it has more of a, of a, a northeasterly uh, um, orientation, then when you leave that boathouse, you will clear the dock, the, the existing dock, your family's dock. That's, that's in essence, it's, it's, your, your issue really isn't about the side setback. That's the instrument by which you want to use it to make sure that the boathouse's orientation is away from your dock, right? And that is absolutely correct. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Jerry. Um, I've got a bad internet connection, so if I lose out here, um, my apologies. Um, I guess the question I've got for Jeanette is, you know, basically the, this is about f future uses. Are we, can we base a decision on a minor variance based on what ifs and possible possibilities? Thank you, through you. Um, 
So when I look at a minor variance application, I look at what the proposal is in front of me because um, but I, it's it's not really because the use of this property or use of this is going to be a boathouse. We're not changing the use of that. So I do look at the proposal that is in front of me, not not what the, what they can do in the future. We do look comprehensively at properties, and you know, for example, this property is going to be pretty much maxed out with what they're going to do. Um, and so I would indicate that to the property owner, but uh, no, I wouldn't make a recommendation based on what a future use could be of this property. And pretty much council should not base it on, on what it is too. So I'm going to have a hard time supporting Mr. Edgar's um, position just based on, you know, what ifs and it could be this and it could be that. Um, I understand that there are docs out there in, in looking at the picture and thank you for that picture. It certainly clarified a few things because we don't see the neighbor's property, of course, um, or the water, I guess I should say. So I do appreciate that. But again, um, based on a decision, um, I think it puts us in a jackpot if we're, we're you know, what ifs. Thank you. Donna. Yes, I don't really believe that. Now, uh, Mr. Edgar has mentioned a what if, a potential bunkie, but really his issue is that if the orientation that is proposed is used, then it would interfere, interfere with the bay and the operation of his dock. So that's not really a what if. He did mention the bunky use, but there still is an existing problem right now with his dock and the um, use of the bay. So I don't think we're talking about a what if. Thank you, yep, Jerry. Maybe I must have understood, Mr. Edgar. I thought he had said if they for future going forward in the future, if they if they wanted to do something with the marine rail, railway, it would then impede. I don't know if Mr. Edgar can 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 uh, um, confirm that, or did I hear that wrong, or maybe members oh, of I, uh, council? Absolutely, speak to that. Uh, thank you, the committee again. Uh, if for whatever reason the uh, the application is approved by committee and that south wall of the new structure is moved four feet south, it will directly obstruct for any current use. If they move and put a new railway in there, we know with that new structure, they could easily put in two new rails. They could put in two new docks. Um, but if that's moved and it comes into that area, the trajectory in line with the neighboring property, they will not be able to use that. So that's why we're saying with an agreement to move that back angle, it permits for not only today's use, but for future use. I, I don't, I, I honestly don't know, um, and I, I know the agent is on the line now, uh, that they're going to remove the uh, the existing marine railway that's designed for a, a four, it's basically a six foot beam bunkie that's in there. If they're going to remove that and put that back into this brand new existing structure, amazing. Um, but they won't be able to move that marine railway whatsoever in its current line. Right now, it runs out, and if a vessel comes down, it will not come into uh, into a collision with the end of the dock. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do know from my previous experience uh, working as a director that absolutely committee can take a look at uh, not necessarily future use, but the current conditions themselves as they align with the article itself for, uh, for the development standards. Thank you. Andy? Yes, Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Hatter, does, would your client have a concern with changing the orientation? Okay. Um, I can't speak to whether you'd have a concern with it or not, um, but I, the, what we have discussed is that existing marine rail, railway, and he is willing to go without it. Um, so rather than, the plan is to leave it there to see if we can use it, but he's willing to not have it there at all. I would have to check with the rest. I, I just, the only reason I ask, I'm just wondering because I, I understand that you may say, well, it doesn't work, I won't use it. But I'm just thinking if he changes the orientation then he doesn't have to worry about that issue. He can, he can, he can, he can put one in if he wants. Um, and then... hey. hey, Madam Chair, this is just a question for um, Jeanette. Jeanette, would there be any problem with uh, changing the orientation slightly um, of the proposed structure um, 
in terms of the topography or anything like that that's currently existing in the property? Thank you, Anita. That actually was, I was just going to try to um, interject here. It's a little difficult when you're, when you're not in council. Um, I, I'm not sure about that because part of the, the reasoning why the expansion is happening towards um, the lot line is because of topography. So if, if the committee was looking at, you know, maybe um, looking at some sort of compromise, it might be in the best interest of the client for us to defer this application to the next meeting in order for um, the agent and the, uh, the applicant to take a look at that and see what would happen if the orientation was switched. Thank you, Jeanette. Actually, I was going to suggest that uh, because uh, when I asked the question, if um, Mr. Edgar had spoken to the applicant, the answer was no. And I think there needs to be some discussion between the parties. So I would entertain a motion to defer this application. Anita moving, Donna seconding, all in favor? It's carried, thank you. All right, thank you. We'll move on to the next application, please, Jeanette. Now I got on mute again, my apologies. Okay, so it's file number A-06-21, um, the owners of the property are Taylor and Brenda Miller. Uh, the agent um, who I believe is in the audience is Holly Richards Conley from Black Point Construction Services and the um, address is 1718 Poplar Point Road um, in the Smith Ward. So uh, this application is seeking relief from the bylaw in order to increase the maximum lot coverage of accessory structures from 5% to 9.7%. Um, and that increase in lot coverage is so that the applicant can construct a boathouse. Um, we do have um, a couple of accessory structures on the property, including some decking. Um, and the decking itself um, is 3.7% of the lot coverage is attributed to that. Uh, so I always take a look at decking and, and uh, determine that it is fairly impervious and does not really um, impact the built form of the property. Um, so I do believe that the, the increase in lot coverage um, is consistent with, uh, with the Township Zoning Bylaw and the Township's official plan, um, as well as the general, or sorry, as well as the variance is available for the appropriate development or land use of land building a structure and the proposed variance is minor in nature. And I have recommended that the committee grant the variance. Um, we have received comments from MTO, um, ORCA, as well as uh, Peterborough Public Health, who have no objections to the application. Thank you. And the agent, Holly Richards Connolly, is here. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, no, I don't. I am just here to answer any questions that Council may have. All right. And the applicant as well. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Miller? You're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, no, nothing to add um, from this end. Okay. And uh, Deputy Clerk, there was no one in opposition? There's no one else here for this application. Thank you very much. I'll bring it to committee. Are there any questions? Anita. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is just a general question um, to Jeanette because um, some of these applications that we're looking at tonight mm -hmm. do require. Um, uh, archaeological assessment. Um, so, um, have any of the applications tonight actually required or gone through the process to, uh, for the archaeological assessments? Um, I'm, I, some of them have. I, I believe this one, the, the assessment is underway, but Holly can confirm that. Um, that. But typically, the applicants that have agents, they tend to get those um, assessments started once they know that one's required. Um, property owners who are doing it on their own, they tend to wait for the application to be approved as the, in the condition as the assessment. Um, through Madam Chair, I can speak to the archaeological assessment. On this property, one um, was deemed not required because of a significant amount of landscaping that was done through an ORCA permit um, in the fall along the shoreline. Thank you. All right, Is, are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to AO721, please, Jeanette. 
Thank you. Just checking to make sure I'm not me. I'm not muted. Um, the property owner is um, are Ellen and Tom Chalbeck, and the agent is um, Gerald Hood and Big Free Home and Cottage Inc., which who I believe is um, here to speak in support of the application. Um, and the property address is 1511 O'Connor Drive in the Ennismore Ward. Um, and this application is looking to decrease the minimum setback from the high water mark from 30 meters to 19.2 meters to a dwelling and from 30 meters to 18.4 meters to structurally on um, structurally non-permanent deck, um, as well as to increase the minimum side yard setback from three meters to 1.9 meters and to increase a lot coverage of all buildings and structures from 20% to 21%. Um, the application or the applicant is seeking relief um, in order to permit the, de the, the demolition of the existing dwelling and shed and then to construct a new dwelling um, together with, uh, uh, with decking and an attached garage. Um, so I have completed a review of the application um, under the four tests for planning act and I do believe that the application meets the general intent and purpose of the township's official plan and zoning bylaw. The variance is desirable for the appropriate development um, or use of land building or structure. Um, and the variance is minor in nature. And I, um, and I have recommended that the variances be granted. We have received comments from MTO, the health unit and ORCA with no objections to the application. We also received comments from the public which uh, um, were attached to uh, the report and the, uh, uh, the neighbors are in support of the application. Thank you very much. I understand the agent, Mr. Hood, is in attendance. Do you have anything to add, sir? Yes, sir, Madam Chair. No, um, nothing at this moment. Just here to answer any questions, if necessary. Thank you very much. And I understand that the um, owner is here, Mr. Chowback. Do you have anything to add? We have nothing to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll bring it to committee. Any questions? Donna. Yes, this is just a comment through you to Jeanette. I really like the way you've included this time, and I don't recall at other times where you put underneath the application public comments, which makes it very easy for us to find out what the neighbors are concerned about or not concerned about. So thank you for doing it that way. All right, are there, are there any other questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next application, 0921, please, Jeanette. Madam Chair, sorry if I could just interrupt, it's Tanya here. I just have someone who's called in, phone number and ending in digits 5875. I just want to make sure they're not here to speak to um, uh, the, the most recent application. If they could just advise what application they're here for. Okay, let's uh, let's move on. They can always type it in the chat, uh, please, if you can let us know what application you're here for. for. Thank you. Jeanette. Thank you. So the property owners are Julie and Jimmy or Irwin, and the address is 2489 Hiawatha Lane in the Smith Ward. Um, so the, um, the applicant is seeking to decrease the minimum setback from the high water mark from 30 meters to 20.3 meters to a dwelling, and from 30 meters to 17 point one meters to a structurally non-permanent deck. Um, the application seeks uh, this relief in order to permit the redevelopment of the lot. So the existing structures will be demolished and, uh, the, and then uh, a new dwelling inclusive of the garage and decking will be constructed. Um, so I have completed a review of the application under the floor test of the Planning Act. And it is my opinion that the general intent and purpose of Township's official plan and zoning bylaw have been maintained. The variance is desirable for the appropriate development or use of land building or structure, and the proposed variance is minor in nature. And I have recommended the variances. Um, we have received comments from MTO, ORCA, and people of public health who have no objections to the application. Thank you very much, Jeanette. Um, I understand that the Owner is here, Mr. Jim Irwin. Do you have anything you wish to add, sir? Uh, I do not at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And there's no one in opposition, Tanya? Sorry, sorry, I'm Madam Chair, I was on mute. Uh, no, there's no one else here for this application. All right, thank you very much. I'll bring it to committee. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to A1021, please. Thank you. So the applicants are Dave and Lynn Walker, and the address of the property is 2814 Antelope Trail in the Smith Ward. The applicants are looking to increase the maximum lot coverage of accessory structures from 5% to 6%. 
um, as well as a decrease in the moon setback from the high water mark from 30 meters to 19.8 meters to an addition to an existing dwelling, and as well as 30 meters to 21 meters uh, to a structurally non-permanent deck. So um, as indicated, these variances are required in order to allow for an addition um, to an existing dwelling. Um, and as well as um, to an addition to an existing deck. So I have completed a review of the application of the fourth test of the Planning Act, and I believe that the general intent and purpose of the township's official plan and zoning bylaw have been maintained. The variance is desirable for the appropriate development or use of land building or structure, and the proposed variance is minor in nature, and I have recommended that the variances be granted. Um, we've received comments from MTO, ORCA, and Payroll Public Health that have no issues with the application. Hey, thank you very much. I understand that the applicant, Dave Walker, is on the line. Do you have anything you wish to add, sir? No, I don't. Thanks. I'm just here in case there's any questions. All right. Thank you. And there's no opposition, correct, Tanya? Nope. We have no one else here for this application. Thank you very much. I'll take it to committee. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next application. A1121, please. So the um, applicant is Helen Boffman and the agent is Holly Richards Conley uh, from Black Point Construction Services. The address is 2599 Hiawatha Lane in the Smith Ward. Um, and so the applicant is seeking to increase the maximum lot coverage of accessory structures from 5 to 5.5 percent and then to decrease minimum setback from the high water mark from 30 meters to 24 meters to an addition to an existing dwelling as well as from 30 meters to 23.5 meters to a structurally non-permanent deck. Um, so again, uh, this application is seeking to, um, to, to construct an addition to a dwelling, um, as, which would include an attached garage, and as well as um, to allow for some additional decking, both on the water side and the road side of the, app, of the uh, existing dwelling. So I have completed a review of the application. I do believe it meets the four tests of the Planning Act, so that its general intent and purpose of the Township Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw have been maintained. The variance is desirable for the appropriate development or use of land building or structure, and the proposed variance is minor in nature. Um, I, um, I, we have received comments from MTO as well as uh, ORCA and Peterborough Public Health. They have no issues with the application. Um, we have also received comments from a neighboring property owner. Um, it, it seems to me that there it was more um, seeking some clarification. There is an existing pathway that does go through this property. This property, a number of properties in Hiawatha down to a beach area and the neighboring property owner was concerned that that would be impacted and the, and the property owner had indicated that they won't be um, um, uh, blocking any access to that pathway. Um, so I relayed that information to the neighbor and I haven't heard anything else. If you've got any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you very much. I understand uh, the agent is here. Holly, do you have anything you wish to add? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, just in regards to an earlier comment about the archaeological assessment, um, typically I like to get those done before these meetings, but given that these um, applications came through sort of in the middle of winter, the archaeological assessments are impossible to complete. So in this case, um, the archaeological assessment has already been booked, and as soon as the stage one has been completed, these stage two digs will also be occurring. So um, there is one on the books. All right, thank you very much. I understand that there is someone here in opposition. Mr. Porter, do you have any questions? You're muted. Mr. Porter. There, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. No, everything, everything's good. I was just concerned about the path for the kids going down from the beach down towards the marina. Uh, but everything seems to be answered there. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there, are there any questions from the committee? Donna. Yes, for you, um, to Jeanette. I was just wondering who does own the property that this shoreline path is on? The, the applicants own it. My understanding from the, the responses is it's historically been used to, to act, alter these properties to access sort of the beach area. And, um, and it's just an unwritten um, 
I don't know, and un, like people just allow them to do that. So it's not, there's no official easement if that's what you're asking. It's just a, a, an access way. Okay, thank you. The neighbors. All right, so we'll move on. Are there any other questions? Sorry. See, none will move on to A1221, please, Jeanette. Is the property owners here are Stephen um, Halzapo and Elaine Herr, and the agent is Eric Williams, and the address of the property is 2778 Newcomb Lane in the Smith Ward. Um, so the applicant is looking to increase the coverage of an accessory structure from 5 to 5.5%, as well as to um, decrease the minimum setback from the high water mark from 30 meters to 24.8 meters. This is in order to um, to reconstruct an existing deck, there will also be some expansion to that existing deck. So I have completed a review of the applications before test the planning act and is my opinion that the township's official plan and zoning bylaw um, have been maintained. The variance is de desirable for the appropriate development or use of land building or structure and the proposed variance is minor in nature. Um, we received comments from MTO, ORCA and the health unit who all um, to have no issues with the application. We also received comments, public comments, which were noted in the report um, in support of the application. It was a neighbor. Thank you very much. And I understand there's no one that is here in support of or opposition to this application, correct, Deputy Clerk? That is correct. I'll bring the application to the committee. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next one. A1321, please. Yes, so this uh, application is um, the, the property owner's grant Coons or it's GNC Building Limited and Graham Coons is, um, is uh, representing them. The address is 19, 1693 Ninth Line in the Smith Ward. Um, the applicant is looking to decrease the front yard setback from 15 meters to 10 meters. Um, this is to allow for the construction of an, uh, of an addition um, to an existing uh, dwelling. I have reviewed uh, the application under the fourth test of the planning act. And it is my opinion that the general intent and purpose of the council's official plan and zoning bylaw have been maintained. Uh, the variance is desirable for the appropriate development and use of land, building, or structure, and the proposed variance is minor in nature. And I have recommended that uh, the variance be granted. Um, we have received comments from MTO, uh, Peterborough Public Health, and ORCA with no issues with the application. Thank you very much. And. Um... The applicant, Tara Coons, was to be here, Deputy Clerk. Uh, yes, she was. I don't see her name listed. I'm not sure if she's the one on the phone. I have enabled the ability to unmute, so we'll just give it a second here. I think you're good to go, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. All right, so when there's no one in opposition either, so I'll bring it to committee. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next application, A1421, please. The property owners are Peter, Peter and Marion Rath. Um, the property address is 2212 Cedarwood Lane in the Smith Ward. Um, the application is seeking relief in order to increase the height of the accessory structure from four meters to 4.8 meters to increase the lot coverage of accessory structures from five to 7% um, and to decrease the high water mark setback from 30 meters to 11 meters to a dwelling from 30 meters to nine meters to a structurally non-permanent deck and from 30 meters to 27.5 meters to a septic system. Um, and also to decrease minimum side yard setback from three meters to 1.8 meters. Um, this application seeks this relief in order to redevelop the waterfront lot with the construction of a dwelling um, and decking, um, as well as the construction of a garage um, at, at, with a height of 4.8 meters. I have completed a review of the application under the planning for test planning act. It is my opinion the general intent and purpose of the township's official plan and zoning bylaw have been maintaining the variance is desirable for the appropriate development or use of land building or structure and is uh, minor in nature. I have recommended that the variance be granted. Um, we received comments from MTO, Peterborough Public Health and uh, ORCA with no issues with the application. Um, we also received comments um, from a neighboring property owner um, uh, who was asking for um, some clarification 
in relation to where the septic system was going to be planned. Um, uh, so I provided him with um, that information and I, and I believe he is on the line, Mr. Bell, but he, he didn't seem to have any further concerns with the application. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rash, do you have anything you wish to add? Madam Chair, thank you very much. We have nothing further to add, thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Bell, do you have anything you wish to add as opposition? You're muted. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't wish to add anything, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll bring it to committee. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to A1521, please. Thank you. So uh, the the applicant is John Sweetman, and the address is um, 2080 Gale Park Drive in the Emmitsmore Ward. Um, so the application is looking to um, increase the maximum recreational trailer unit size or area from 44 square meters to 60.2 square meters in order to um, allow for uh, the existing trailer to be removed and a new one to be replaced on the property. So I um, I have completed a review of the application under the four class test of the Planning Act. And I do believe that the intent, of, the intent and purpose of the Township's official plan and zoning bylaw have been maintained. The variance is desirable for the appropriate development to use of land building or structure and the proposed variance is minor in nature. And I recommend that the variance be granted. We have received comments from ORCA, MTO, and the Conservation Authority, or I said that MTO, Peterborough Public Health, who have no issues with the application. Um, and we did receive um, some comments which have been attached to this report. Um, we, uh, so people who have some concerns as it relates to um, the, the size of the structure, um, uh, privacy issues, as well as, um, as uh, view to the, to view to the lake being obstructed. Um, so the comments that were, that were um, added, or I think it was Mr. Wright's comments, but we did have some additional comments from um, Chuck and Christy Gaudet, as well as from Doris Gaudet, and I believe both are on the line to speak to their concerns. Um, so I'll leave it at that and hopefully be able to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I understand that the applicant is on the line, Margaret So, Do you have anything that you wish to add? Would that be the phone number, Tanya? No, no I believe that's uh, that. Mr. John Sweetman. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, um, I, I think I heard you guys say that someone was complaining about uh, blocking their view. Right. That, that's right. We did receive some comments of concerns that the new trailer and the orientation of the trailer will, will create issues. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Sweet. Sorry about this. Hello? Yes, we're here. I'm not sure what's wrong with you. We can hear you. Just proceed. Okay, move back. I'm sorry about this. I'm not sure what's going on with my internet. We can hear you, sir. Hello? Hello. So, sorry about this. I'm not sure what happened to my internet. Am I on now? Yes, you are. Continue, please. Okay. I was just I was just wondering, um, someone you guys were saying someone was complaining about blocking the view, but if you look at the if you look at the where the trailer is now and where their trailer is, it's already blocking their view. You know what I mean? They don't have any access to the water from where their from where their trailer is set up. And I'm not having it lengthwise. I'm putting it. Uh, I'm not. I don't have it width uh, width either. So I'm putting it longer. So that would have more access for them to have waterfront view. Okay. Was there anything else? No, nope, it's all in the drawings and all that. Okay. All right. Um, well, you're here if we need to ask you questions. Yep. Um, and so in opposition, who is speaking um, in opposition? I have here Doris Gaudet. Yes, Madam Chair, Doris is on the line. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Doris Cadet, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my uh, and my husband. And then after my brother Charles Chuck was unable to stay on the call, so I'm going to speak for him as well. Yeah. So my husband Richard Kaplan and I purchased a lot two years ago and put a 33 foot trailer on it. We are directly behind the proposed the proposal lot in the second row of trailers. And we have a very narrow, but nice view of the lake between the trailers in front of us. Before purchasing, we did our research with the park rules and the township bylaws, which showed that oversized trailers cannot be installed in this area. Therefore, we proceeded with our purchase. In this proposal, if this proposal is approved, the width and height of the trailer will be like placing a wall in front of us and the view will be even more narrow, but as seen in the diagram, where they have placed their shed will block any view we will have completely. And approving this proposal will mean that future similar requests could be approved or will be approved as well. And if all neighboring trailers are replaced with oversized trailers, we will be walled in, making our lot seem like a tiny little area with a small trailer, which it is not. For the above reasons, our property value and, and enjoyment will be decreased if the proposal is passed. And then for my brother, Chuck Gadet and his wife, Christy Gadet, so they are directly to, if you're looking from the water at the new trailer, they're directly to the right of that. And because the position of the new trailer is coming out 21 feet from the other trailer, the new trailer deck will look directly into the complete living space of their, my brother's trailer. And so they're concerned about privacy issues. And uh, because it's a, like it's glass across the front. So you can see directly into everything in their trailer. And also he's concerned that this should be done when the park opens. So the park isn't even open. Nobody can even really go up there to, um, measure and determine and see where this is all sitting and and you know we're just concerned or my brother is saying could this wait until April 15th when the park is open and discussions can be had as to maybe how this could be placed a little bit different that it's in a better position thank you thank you Jeanette yeah so I I can't I can't speak to you. Um, I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't go up into the into the park and, and you know, sit at these um, individual um, uh, trailers to, to sort of see it for myself. But what I can tell you is the orientation is changing. Um, so the actual setback on the one side is increasing. Um, uh, and then the storage shed could be put somewhere else if, if that was required. That's not part of the minor variance application. The only part of the minor variance application is the um, is the increase uh, in the in the overall size of the property. Um, the setback that I, I think that they're speaking of um, that is encroaching upon the um, the is it Chuck I guess for that um, that setback is is still within what is required of the bylaw um, and how, and is actually only decreasing by it looks like uh, about nine inches. So. If you look at both the site plan and the um, and the proposed plan, um, the, I, I I would say that things would be improved. But I'm but I I haven't been I've been to the site, but I didn't go up to you know to look down on the on the water from the property. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jeanette, but uh, this is generally not something we take into consideration when we're dealing with committee of adjustment matters. Not from a planning perspective, you're absolutely correct. It's not something that the board would accept as a as a planning rationale. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, I'll bring it to committee. Are there any questions? In the sorry, Madam. Sorry, Madam Chair. We have a, a Mr. Uh, Paul Wright as well to speak on this application. Oh, okay. Don't have him on my list. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a few concerns here. Um, personally, I don't have any objections to uh, John Sweetman, if it is in fact John Sweetman Sr. Uh, proposing this proposal. Uh, I would suggest that to accommodate the trailers behind, that you allow the uh, south, uh, if you allow the new trailer to be moved five feet to the south portion of the lot, uh, giving the setback as five feet from the lot line. 
uh, to increase that uh, view for the, uh, um, the doors behind and move the shed over to the other side of the lot, pull the shed over to the other side of the lot where the existing shed is, that would open up that area for them. Another issue I have here is, is um, uh, a survey of the lot in order to ensure that the uh, proposal is placed where it is planned to be, that there should be a survey done because there are no corner pegs existing on the lot. So in order to keep everybody happy that you should have a survey, there should be a survey done on this lot. Um, the, other, the other issue is, is um, uh, compliance to the, to the bylaws, which is, seems to be up in the air totally uh, for many years in Gale Park Society Association. For instance, lot two was redeveloped recently. Setbacks uh, are violated. Uh, I believe that in the positioning that John is doing, um, he could do his, put his lot, his, if, he, if he was allowed to, put his trailer, his new trailer existing uh, in the same direction as the existing one. But he's turning at 90 degrees to accommodate the length Okay, also to accommodate setbacks. Whereas a lot too was not required to road, to turn the trailer 90 degrees and does not meet the setbacks. So what has to be for one person needs to be for the other. Okay, so the question here is, is John in this matter being discriminated against the individual that we, that we developed lot two? And I have to, and I have to uh, relate to that personally, because 10, 12 years ago, I had to deal with the same darn thing and being discriminated against and with regards to bylaw issues in the park. So with regards to Gill Park Chair and Gill Park Cottage Association, there does not seem to be a set standard of rules for everyone in the park. And now that's not your fault. That is a part of the, that, that is part of the association itself. Yeah. But all this needs to be corrected and verified uh, now, for the lot coverage of John's uh, proposal, he is well within uh, the 35% lot coverage. In fact, he's actually about 27%. Your maximum is 35. So why is he required to have a variance and pay for the variance fees if that's so? He should not have to be required to pay those variance fees. But I do strongly believe that there needs to be a survey. So where, wherever this his proposal and his, his uh, coverage of facilities are made, that they are exactly as per the plan and as per the required survey. Thank you, um, Mr. Sweetman. Do you want to speak to that or Jeanette? Oh, sorry, so excuse me, An another question here. The trailer, is it considered a, uh, a double wide being two trailers um, sorry, side, by side by side. Sorry, sir. This really isn't part of the minor variance application. I'm sorry. Well, I beg to differ. Is the add on an actual trailer or is it an add on such as a sunroom? It's an add on room. I can speak to that, Sherry. Um, it, trailer with an add-on room and they're both um, created by a manufacturer. Um, I can just speak to a couple of points if you'd like me to. Um, as it relates to moving the, um, the trailer to one side or the other, uh, uh, there are other parameters that we have to look at in our bylaw and one is the distance that this will be from other trailers and so I know that the applicant has located this to ensure that those setbacks have been met. Um, as it relates to the development of another lot within um, this and uh, within Gale Park, um, that's not part of this application. So if there are concerns or issues with that, um, we, sh we should bring that to our building department. Um, as for a survey, 
Uh, typically, we do not ask for a survey to be completed when it's not a setback issue. The applicant is able to meet with all the setback requirements of the zoning bylaw. This is about the size. And so that leads me to the final question that Mr. Um, that Mr. Wright had, and it was in relation to why he needed the variance. We do have a maximum size um, for a trailer, and uh, this 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 particular trailer with the add-on room um, will be greater than that, and that's why the variance is required. And yes, he is well within the the 35% lot coverage um, requirement, and so that's part of the rationale or the reason why I felt that this was um, something that we would be able to support. Thank you. All right, well, so Tanya, was there anyone else here in uh, opposition to this application? There's no one else here to speak to this application. Thank you very much. I'll bring it to committee. Questions? Donna. Through you to Jeanette. Jeanette, I'm confused as to why um, Gale Park trailer sites, I don't know what the difference is in Gale Park and say Skyline and Grandview and Pine Grove. Um, we never get applications that I can recall from those other parks. What is the difference between Gale Park and the other trailer parks in the township? I think it really is the, the lots on in this in on these properties are, are are larger, so they they can meet with they can do more stuff with they can do. Um, they can add larger buildings or uh, trailers to these, these properties. I'm, I'm guessing that's pretty much what the issue is, um, or where where the um, why there's such a difference. Um, because other um, the other trailer parks, because they're so narrow and they're together and they're closer together, they really couldn't fit anything else besides what is sort of for, um, sometimes even smaller than what the bylaw um, it, the bylaw would allow. Plus, I, I'm just surmising, Donna. I'm not entirely sure. Okay, so one more point, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering then, um, we received uh, an application last year for Grandview to expand. So could we expect these types of um, minor variances coming through from Grandview when they do their redevelopment? Or do you really know? I, I honestly couldn't speak to that. I'm going to guess no, um, because they're creating lot sizes and they they, they also have, um, uh, so the lots that they're creating will accommodate um, what they would, what they want to accommodate. But I can't speak to that because each um, property or trailer park property owner would, you know, would have something in mind that they'd want to put in place. So I couldn't say definitively that we would never receive an application for a minor variance. Madam Chair, it's it's Rob Lamar. Can I can I just interject very yes. quickly? I, there, there there is a material difference between the Gale Park and a traditional trailer park. Um, now, typically, a trailer park is owned by uh, an entity, an individual, or a corporation, and they create lots that that are you know essentially defined on a piece of paper, but have no um, have no standing in terms of being saleable, right? So they're just they're just depicted on a piece of paper and and as a trailer owner, you're allowed to place your your, your trailer on it, uh, and you know when when you leave it, it's 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 still in the ownership of the the corporation. This Gill Park is is not a typical trailer park. It's you know the lots that that uh, are depicted on the, the site plan or the survey that's that's uh, been produced with or provided with the application are actually privately owned, right? So so you're part of a you're part of a, a larger group, but my understanding is you actually you own you own that space and it's defined and uh, I think Mr. Wright notes that they're not pegged like there aren't standard iron bars but you know there's something that that has some value there that that uh, that you own and and that you can develop and and pass on uh, to and sell or pass on to 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 uh, your loved one so there is a material difference in how you know and how. Uh, Gale Park operates versus what a tra traditional trailer park is, and so we've we've seen people actually expending a, a lot of, a lot of money uh, to develop their properties. Certainly, the waterfront properties. There was rezonings done to allow for, you know, semi permanent, really like very very uh, you know, relatively fancy um, 
seasonal dwellings, right? Uh, because you know, there's there's some value there that could be that could be sold at a future date, right? So that I think is, you know, it's it's pretty unique in terms of how uh, uh, in terms of a setup, but uh, it, and it creates these unique challenges when it comes to people wanting to develop them with uh, with you know fairly uh, expensive and fancy uh, uh, trailers. Thanks for that clarification, Rob. All right. Are there any other questions from the committee? I have a question, if I could. Uh, sorry, we're at the committee now, Mr. Wright. Andy? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and through you to Jeanette, uh, there's been a lot of conversation, but so I just want to clarify in my mind. The issue for a variance is very limited. It's strictly the size of the trailer. Nothing to do with setbacks or anything else. It's simply the size of the trailer. Am I correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions for this application? Seeing none, we will move on to A1621, please. Okay, thank you. I have uh, many pieces of paper on my uh, desk and I've lost this report, so just give me one second. Okay, the property owner is uh, Cynthia McKean, um, and the address is 1732 West Dew Point Road in the Smith Ward. The applicant is looking to increase the maximum lot coverage of an accessory structure from 5% to 8.3%, and as well as to decrease the minimum um, uh, high water mark setback from 30 meters to 11 point meters in order to allow for the um, construction of a garage. So there is an existing garage on the property and is going to be replaced with um, the construction of a new uh, larger garage. Um, I have completed a review of the application and it is uh, my opinion that it meets the general intent and purpose of the Township's official plan and zoning bylaw. The variance is desirable for the appropriate development or use land of building your structure and the variance is minor in nature and I've recommended that the variance um, uh, the variances uh, be or the variance be approved. We have received comments from MTO, Orca, and the health unit with no concern with the application. Right, thank you very much. And I understand the applicant, Cynthia McKean, is on the line. Do you have anything you wish to add? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just you're muted. Hello. Yeah, we got you now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In regards to the um, question about the archaeological assessment, I have had a stage two assessment done, and there was no archaeological material found. Thank you very much. Deputy Clerk, there was no one in opposition for this application? No, we have no one else here for this application. Thank you. I'll bring it to committee. Any questions? Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion to approve the applications that we've just heard. Jerry moves it, seconded by Anita. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. We have a deferred matter, A60, A5220. Uh, so this, sorry, I'm just going to okay. Uh, so this application is related to uh, 1571, the ninth line, which um, came before the committee um, in December. Um, and at that time, um, it was noted that there wasn't enough detail in order to establish consistency with the different policy documents that, um, that we need to be cognizant of. Um, so the application was deferred to provide the um, property owner with an opportunity to satisfy um, those requirements. And so a natural um, heritage system review, um, a scoped um, a natural heritage system evaluation was completed. Um, and that was reviewed by ORCA, um, who have identified that the different mitigation measures that will be put into place to ensure that the key hydrologic feature is, um, is, is not adversely impacted um, would be appropriate. Um, and then finally, the other component of that was in relation to uh, aggregate resources that have been identified to be near um, and, and near the property. Um, so the, uh, the applicant's agent has provided some information um, uh, from a neighboring property owner or the neighboring um, uh, aggregate operator and that identifies uh, that the, um, the reserves that are um, in that area as it moves towards the property uh, seem to be diminishing in quality or, and also um, have provided um, a map that shows 
in that there are primary and tertiary deposits in the area. Um, those, uh, this property or proposal seems to be really close to the boundary going from the primary to the tertiary deposits. I have spoken with um, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and it's sort of given the information that the aggregate operator provided as well as um, the, the mapping showing that it's sort of transitioning to a tertiary area, um, the ministry um, said they could be convinced that the resources may not be a primary aggregate deposit. The only way we would definitively know that is if, um, is if a, um, uh, an aggregate resource assessment was completed. Um, but if the committee is satisfied that the information does provide sufficient evidence that that resource, the aggregate resource is not a feasible resource, then I would recommend that the four tests, uh, that the application would meet the four tests under the Planning Act and it should be granted. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer that. Ma'am, I do believe that Emma Drake, who is the agent, is on the line if anybody has any questions of her. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Drake, do you have anything you wish to add? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, nothing further to add um, from me. I think Jeanette has summarized it very well. Um, there is some aggregate noted on the property, but uh, there is already a residence on this property that would um, limit any extraction there. Uh, and as Jeanette has noted, the information that we have from Drain Brothers and uh, from the mapping available from the province shows that um, it does diminish, the quality of the resource does diminish as you um, go towards this portion of the property where the second dwelling unit is proposed. Uh, if there are any further questions or discussion, uh, I am here to help. Thank you very much. And we have nobody that's in opposition that is on the line. So I will bring it to the committee. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I will, I'm looking for a mover for this application. Anita and Donna, all in favor? It's carried. Thank you very much. We have no correspondence. The minutes of the Committee of Adjustment meeting of February the 23rd, 2021. Andy and uh, Jerry, all in favor? It's carried. And a motion to adjourn. Our next meeting is April the 27th. Jerry and Donna, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we'll start council at 625.
Sherry seems to have dropped off. She's just coming to town. Okay. Hi, Sherry. Okay. Um, are we ready to go? Tanya? Yeah, we're good to go. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. We'll now call the regular uh, council meeting for March 23rd, 2021 uh, to order. And I'd like us to begin by observing a moment of silence so the council staff and members of the public can quietly reflect on our duty to the community we are trying to serve. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, members of the public, staff, presenters, and members of council, please be advised that meetings are broadcast and recorded and made available on the internet. The uh, agenda has been circulated. Colleagues, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest? Madam Clerk, please note that there was none noted. We then will go to our minutes. We have uh, minutes, two sets of minutes, I believe, right? Uh, March the 9th, as well as March the 3rd. Any questions about any of those? Sherry. I'll just move them. Thank you. We second her, Anita. Uh, any comments? All those in favor? Those are carried. Okay. We'll then move on to our delegations. I believe we have one delegation this evening. Uh, Mr. Torella. Is Mr. Torella on the line? Yes, he is. I can see him. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, uh, you have 10 minutes. Uh, as you get close to the end of your 10 minutes, I'll give you a little heads up that we're getting close to the end of the time. So, uh, Mr. Torella, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm back again uh, asking you to review my documents, and I, obviously you have, as they are part of this deputation. I would ask you to look into why it's been 3,200 days since I've had my per since I've not gotten the bear permit. When are this council going to step up and do their job and uh, issue my permit? I don't. This is not my goal in life to create a problem for this township. I only want to complete my retirement home and my workshop. You've read the documents. You've seen what has gone on. Four members have been on this council from 2012. None of you have done anything because there's always been, Mr. Lamar took me to court prematurely and I've been fighting with the courts ever since. So there's no litigation now. There is nothing wrong with my drawings. I've done everything I've been required. Minor variance was applied for, received. Now tell me, what more am I to do to get a permit? This council is responsible for what goes on within the management of the township. No one has been had enough nerve to step up and say something's wrong, other than this year where you went to performance concepts. And clearly there is a problem. I'm just asking you now, issue my permit, Put an end to this nonsense, please. That's all I have to say. You've read the documents. You know what I've been put through. Nothing else can be done other than to go back to court, which has wasted already ta taxpayers dollars. So we're probably over 150,000 in legal fees. Tell me, what are we doing? Is this how we run our township? We have 17,000 people in this township voters. And why is it that one man is controlling all the zoning, all the building code, everything? And we seem to be always something going on with what's going with this setup. Now, 
Mr. Lamar says he's going to retire soon. Well, you're going to have to, just my point is, how do I proceed from here? Please tell me. Are you, have you completed your uh, oh, have you Have you read, just answer, have you read the documentation? Mr. Torella, are, have you completed your presentation? Yes, have you read, but have you read okay, the document? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Heron. Mr. Heron, yeah. Uh, motion. Do I have a seconder? There's a motion to receive. Seconded by Anita. Any discussion? All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you, Mr. Torella. We'll now move on to a uh, question period. Are there any registered questions? I understand there is not. Uh, so we will then move on to our uh, municipal and uh, staff reports. The first one is uh, the zoning bylaw amendment at 1824 8th line in Smith Ward. And uh, I, Jeanette, did you want to speak to that? Uh, sure, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this bylaw, as you would call, we had the public meeting at the last council meeting. Um, and this is to uh, amend the, um, the site specific zone category rural residential exception 413 um, of the subject lands to rural residential 413 holding. Um, there'll be a textual amendment that would um, allow for uh, the business of, um, of a detailing um, boat and uh, automobile detailing business to operate. Um, and as well as the holding provision would ensure that we enter into a site plan agreement with the, um, with the property owner, um, which would detail um, all the uh, different recommendations that were made with the different studies that were part of the application. The one issue that was outstanding at the last meeting was um, in relation to uh, how the gray water will be disposed of. Um, so we have spoken with our peer review consultants, um, Stantec, and um, they feel that it would be appropriate to iron out those details through the site plan stage um, or through the site plan process. So that is um, what I am recommending. So I do recommend um, that the bylaw um, 2021 015 be brought forward to the bylaw section of the agenda um, for council's consideration. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sherry, Sherry go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move the recommendation, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Seconder, Jerry. Any questions on the motion? We have a mover and a seconder. All those in favor? Gary, thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Uh, we'll now go on to our next report from the chief uh, regarding motor vehicle accident. Good evening all, Mayor Mitchell. Uh, I think we've finally come up with a process uh, where we can maybe try to recoup some of the costs of attending uh, some of these NVCs where a highway traffic infraction is issued. Um, Kind of a, a twofold issue here. So, where uh, you know, I think what we'll carry on is we'll try to uh, try to figure out if if there was an HTA uh, involved in the NVC, and then once a month get these uh, these buildings in, and I think we'll still carry on, and then uh, send the, the the initial billing uh, to to the insurance company if uh, there's so there is one for sure. So again, uh, we had one insurance company uh, cooperators that uh, they actually they you know wanted they wanted a policy or see what policy or whatever we had in place that uh, they you know we could charge a billing so and that come forward I think we're getting paid for that so maybe that's a good thing um, now if uh, we get a, a letter back or something back from the insurance company that says that uh, they refuse to pay this then. Uh, hopefully it won't take that long, but then we'll send that bill if we know uh, address and everything else to that driver itself. So again, over a period of time that uh, if no pay, then uh, we can always uh, use the service of a collection agency. So I think this is one way that, you know, we could try a double end, double end here that 
that we might get some recoup some of these costs uh, that our uh, taxpayers don't pay for you know some of that actually causes an accident where there's a highway traffic act uh, in, infraction so i think it might be the, uh, our only and really best possible uh, outcome for this so thank you gord a question Scott? yes through you to gord Gord, the last time you brought this to council, I didn't support it based on uh, the fact that um, it was premature. And I just wondered, have you had an opportunity to find out how many other municipalities are doing this? Yeah, and that, uh, that's, uh, we uh, you know, had quite a conversation with a number of uh, departments and a lot of them have, uh, you know, have had the same kind of, uh, problems in the past so uh, a couple of them right now are trying it this way uh, and uh, really it's probably a little early to tell what uh, you know what kind of what kind of uh, follow-up they're having with this so um, uh, anybody on the uh, 400 highways or the king's highways they can directly bill the ministry or the mto to get that coverage and again they've They've got to they've got to have their facts and figures in place, and then I, I believe the MTO must chase maybe the insurance company. But uh, it, this is a whole new thing for a lot of us. Uh, there are you know there are quite a number of municipalities that they don't bill at all. But uh, seeing we're kind of in an area that uh, quite a few people and quite an influx of people come through here, that's usually when our 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 MVCs go up. And it's usually just not even the locals, but uh, but it's uh, one way the, to help cover some of the costs that we all have, kind of bear when uh, when we go out to uh, look after these uh, incidents themselves. So it, it, it might take a while, Donna. But I think you have put a lot of thought into the policy and you're going to give people time and you're trying to be fair. So I think I can support it now. Thank you, Donna. I think Jerry had a question. Thank you. Through you too, Chief. I've got a couple questions, Mr. Mitchell, um, and a couple comments as well. Um, Chief, the um, what would the average billable cost be for the last few calls for a um, Highway Traffic Act uh, a charged um, call? So, uh, Gwen did up a little sheet here this morning. So, uh, we've had two, four, five uh billings to date and there's a sheet that'll be going in this the end of this month so the average billing right now is about a thousand three hundred and thirty two dollars so it runs the gauntlet from uh there's a couple in here that are four hundred and eighty eight dollars and forty cents so <clears throat> there's one vehicle and they were billed the, the mto rate which is four eighty eight forty uh, it goes with the number of vehicles on scene. So uh, again, there's a couple in here that have had two and three. We haven't had anything really major this year. And, you know, that's kind of one of those knock on wood that uh, uh, literally, I don't think there's going to be another four or five that are going to be billed this next month. So people are, are wisening up, but uh, you know, you get into a, a scene where, you know, there's a major injury or, or God forbid there's a death that uh, we could be tied up three and four and five, six hours with uh, one, maybe two vehicles to, the, to help the, any of the police services. All right, so thank they you. Add well, th thanks, Chief. Um, and then on the high end um, of the, that average would be? Uh, the high one was 1,465.20. So it looks like roughly maybe four vehicles there or, or two vehicles for a couple hours. Okay, thank you. I did a little bit of due diligence, called a couple neighboring municipalities, um, had a chat with them. Um, again, like Chief said, everybody's kind of up in the air on how they do it and the best approach. So I called my insurance company and I talked to my insurance agent. He got a hold of Aviva Insurance and apparently Aviva pays them like crazy um, all the time when they have um, a bill sent to them. However, in conversation with him, We've got it where we're going to send the invoice to the insurance company. Does anybody here know at head office who they deal with at the insurance company? Probably not, but you know your broker. So what the broker suggested to me today was send it to the customer or the, the, the person charged 
Now it gets the attention. They're, they'll call their broker, have a conversation with the broker who knows who to talk to at the head office. So um, that, that seems to be the general consensus in, in, in this gentleman talked to a couple other brokers today of the best way to get paid for this. Because if, if it was me, I'm going to talk to my guy. I'm going to say, hey, listen, I'm a good customer. I've been with you for 30 years. You know, I've got all this with you. What are you going to do for me? He'll fight for you to cover that cost. Now we're, we're, we're you know, getting our money. Um, I think there's a better chance of getting our money when you've got that broker person relationship rather than trying to, to Aviva just saying, you know, what the hell with you guys? We don't, you know, we don't know you. Those are my thoughts. If, if we prioritized it as to the customer, if you will, then insurance. Jared, in the past, what uh, we've been able to do is, uh, I don't know if we had, I haven't bought one probably in three years, but uh, the insurance companies put out a booklet that lists every insurance company and broker in, uh, in the province and uh, pretty well, I guess maybe Canada is what it is. And so it's just a case of looking up uh, that, you know, as long as we know who that person's insurance is, then we could follow up and send the bill and it's worked. Now that, that may work, but then think about that person who's been charged on the Highway Traffic Act. Do you think he's going to want to call his insurance company who says it was my fault? Oh, geez. <laughs> uh, he, he may hedge on that too. I, I, I you know, that's just a uh, thought that it's happened, I think, uh, a while ago. So. And I could go either way on this thing. I just want to make sure we're getting as much revenue back as we can. Oh, so, geez. you know, whatever the team decides here. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, because sorry, sorry, Mayor. This kind of leaves it open ended like that. So, you know, that could be tried. Okay. Let me, uh, I just want to make sure you have this clear in my mind. So, first off, we're talking about uh, individuals who've been charged. Yes. So, that's the first step. And uh, if they, that individual happens to have no insurance, then you would send the bill to the, to the, uh, to the, the individual. individual. But if they have insurance, you're going to send it to, the insurance and only if the insurance doesn't pay will you send it to the individual so first you got to be charged second of all it goes to your insurance company and if they don't pay then it would go to you that's sort of the hierarchy that you've developed right i think that's suggestive and then maybe there, there might be that there might be that scenario like jerry said that you know that might have to work that way but you know for the most part that does get to the insurance company and all of a sudden they look at it, it's a bill and go, oh, you know, so. Okay, I, I'm, I'm comfortable, it's, 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 it's worth trying. I think we need to try to recover uh, those, uh, those costs. So do I have somebody who's willing to move it? It looks like Anita is willing to move it. Jerry will second it. Any additional questions? All those in favor? Terry, thank you colleagues and thank you chief. Uh, we'll now go on to the next report, which is a curbside garbage collection. I think Janice is going to speak to that. Yes, thank you. Um, so as you may recall from our work plan uh, discussions, our curbside garbage collection contract does expire this year at the end of September. Uh, so there are a number of things going on in the waste management area uh, Currently, some of them have been going on for a while, um, but the, the, for a few reasons, we've, we've had some conversation with uh, our curbside contractor and uh, they have agreed that they would uh, move forward with a one-year extension uh, with the option for a second year uh, given a review of circumstances at the time. So right now we have um, our clear bag program, which will be uh, going into transition from a kind of a soft launch into enforcement in in September. So carrying on with our current curbside contractor would definitely provide some continuity of service while we're going through that um, challenging period of time. Uh, we have had ongoing um, information uh, coming from the province and, and some locally in terms of some potential for organics and some requirement for organ organics to be re removed from the waste stream. We don't have a, a firm direction on that yet, so giving us a little bit more time might um, allow us to have some of that information uh, to develop a future collection program. And probably one of the most important things is, is the county is currently undertaking a review 
of waste management services coming out of its uh, integrated service delivery review. So that is underway. It's not expected to be complete probably until early in 2022. And that definitely could have some impact on garbage collection across the county. So um, for those reasons, we are recommending that we would move forward with an extension of our curbside contract um, for one or, or two years, potentially, depending on what those circumstances look like um, when we review it again after the one year. I did just provide you with a bit of an update as well on the clear bag program and, and some of the activities that have been going on um, to move us through that soft launch and into September when we'd be looking, uh, looking to enforcement. So that information is there. Um, based on kind of just anecdotal evidence from our collectors, they're saying about 30% of our residents have switched over to clear bags. So that is good, um, but still a long, a long way to go. So we have our, our work cut out for us. And also at the landfill site, I think we do, we do need some concerted efforts there because we're really not seeing uh, folks coming in there with, with clear bags being used. So still a lot of work to do, but we are making progress. Thank you. Questions, colleagues? Sherry? Move the recommendation. Vita is seconding it. Uh, I had a I had a question uh, or, or a comment and, and a question. So first of all, when we were doing the uh, uh, efficiency study on the landfill site, one of the issues that had come up is how we are going to handle uh, an opaque bag that somebody brings to the landfill site after September the first. Have, have we concluded on on how we're going to handle that? Yeah, so again, there'll, there'll be that transition period. I think the one thing that, that uh, KMBM recommended to try and help us with that was the consideration of um, a, an increased fee for those mixed uh, bags or bags where people weren't bringing it in in the clear bags to try and help us encourage people to actually make that switch um, over time. So you'd probably, you know, we, we'd we let people. We've been letting people know that they're going to have to transition to clear bags. We would continue to do that. We'd probably give one, maybe two warnings, and then after that, they would they would um, be charged an additional fee if they did not bring the material in in opaque bags. So, so that is something that council will have to consider as part of a tipping free review, which we are um, working on right now and would anticipate having to you in April. Okay, and the comment that I wanted to make was when we make the switch over, and this goes back to an experience we had when we got a new contractor uh, for uh, recycling at the county. One of the things that was overlooked was you're gonna get a lot of inbound calls. It's just inevitable. People are gonna have inquiries and they never upgraded their their service. And so uh, they were they, they had a limited number of, limited number of messages that could be left. And after that, it just shut down. And it was really frustrating for clients. And once that was pointed out, they upgraded it and, and made sure that they could do that. So I just want to make sure that as we hit the first, when we, when we implement this, that we've got the capacity, uh, either our contractor, and, and I'm assuming we have it at the township office, the ability to handle inquiries. Because a lot of people, uh, you know, I know it's been a long run up, but until you actually do it, a lot of people won't uh, have twigged to, it's coming uh, that, that, that it's coming into effect. So I just want to make sure that that from a from a client services perspective that we'll be ready on the first of September. Yeah, for sure. So so we as as I mentioned, we will be continuing with our efforts to make uh, to with the public education around the clear bag program. So certainly we'll be doing our best to get that message out there. There are going to be calls, and yes, we we're going to need to be prepared to take them as our um, the contractor. So we'll, we'll, we will um, we will for sure be considering that. Okay, thank you. We have a mover and a seconder. If there's no other questions, all those in favor? That is carried. Thank you, colleagues. We'll now go on to Lane uh, and, or to Adam. I don't know who's going to speak to it. And this is the uh, generator system replacements. If you would go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I'll be speaking to the report tonight. I did want to Thank Adam for the work that he's done, not only on this report, but uh, reports back in November and January as well. Um, Council will recall that uh, the TSSA had actually issued a, a number of notifications in the fall of 2020 as it related to our three backup uh, generators. 
So uh, staff completed an RFP for upgrades to address these uh, noted items. Um, uh, but upon receipt of the RFP in the fall, staff requested a deferral until the January meeting, uh, which council approved. And uh, as noted in the report before council tonight, at the January meeting, uh, council directed staff to reject all uh, RFPs for upgrades and instead to uh, issue a tender for full replacement. So this report is the result of that tender. We did have a good interest in the tender. And at the end of the day, we received uh, four bids. Uh, we're, we're pleased to say that Supply Point, which was the low bid on the overall project, also had a, a complete package um, that, that would replace all uh, three generators at the site. I'll just uh, point out uh, under the financial impact section to council that uh, in addition to the standard wording that we would have when we bring a tender forward to council in terms of receipt for information, uh, award of tender, and then the agreement. In this instance, because two of these generators are being uh, upsized for future uh, demand, that there's a portion of these which are eligible for development charges as well. So it's important at this juncture that council uh, Notif uh, notifies the public in, in with, with respect to the actual resolutions put forward. And in that instance, when we do another development charges study, we have this uh, in the record and uh, I can present this to our consultant. And then that oversizing is actually, uh, uh, which is there to accommodate future growth would be available under a development charge. I'd be uh, prepared to answer any questions if council had any. Thank you, Lane. Questions, colleagues? Uh, Donna? Yes, through you to Lane. Lane, I, I'm sorry that I may have misunderstood what you said, but I just got the um, chart up of the different prices. And did you say that supply point came in low on all three generator bids? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we, when we tendered this, we needed to tender them as a package of all three together. So while, while some of them were high and low, they put together the most complete package with all three. So for the uh, contractors to be able to identify any economies of scale, uh, we tendered in such a way that they would get all three generators. And when we did that, uh, supply point was the low. Okay, that I understand that now. I just thought that um, you had said it differently. So thank you very much. Anybody else have a question? Not seeing any, I'll look for a mover. Uh, Anita, seconded by Donna. All those in favor? That is carried. Okay, colleagues, consent items. Is there any items people would like pulled? Sherry. 8A. 8A. Okay, uh, Donna. You mute it, Donna. 5B and correspondence number 15, 16, 17 and the Peterborough County report, the county official plan project, the one related to agricultural and rural areas. I think that's all. Okay, Anita. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was also going to ask for 6A15 with regards to the cannabis enforcement, but I'll wait to hear what Donna has to say because she might have the same question I do. Okay, and I just want to make sure I get, Sherry, you said 8A. What was the other one that you said? Just 8A? Yeah, okay, good. So let's get started with 5B. Got me now. Okay, I just wanted to give a little bit of background. This is um, pretty straightforward that we approved the, um, the lottery event license, but it's um, a business on Chemong Road, Core the Clean Air, and they've been working with PRHC and unfortunately the city of Peterborough and nobody made the connection that um, Core the Clean Air is in Selwyn. So, they had a lot of time wasted 
and they had to um, give an end time for the selling of their tickets. So they gave June 30th or some sometime in June. And then they found out they had to come through Selwyn Council. So what they're doing is raffling off a $1,900 barbecue to give all the profits to the PRHC Foundation. And um, they have a time crunch to the end of June. So if anybody wants to buy a ticket, I'm sure they'll be out in the community or they could stop in and they'd really appreciate it. Thank you, Donna. Uh, colleagues, I forgot to mention, I'd like 5D and correspondence number three pulled. So, uh, and I think 5D is up. So um, on 5D too, I, I, I think if, if Ted is here or if Gord's here, uh, did we only get the one uh, quote? Yeah, Ted having some issues there, Mayor. It sounds like uh, or Nexicom's having issues everywhere. But uh, yeah, it was just the one. <laughs> Ted literally sent out, oh, I'm not sure, uh, probably a dozen. But uh, it's one of those things that uh, they don't, a lot of these little boat, or boat companies don't do these RFPs the way we had it set out where you know, it's, quite indulging to fill out. So Paris did <laughs> and uh, had a little bit of an issue. He had four boats uh, actually uh, priced out and we thought, oh, geez, that's kind of expensive. And you had to uh, review that. So yeah, it's uh, it come in. It's a little bit more than we had budgeted for. But the issue is that we were paying the 20 22 price and we probably won't get them for well over a year probably almost maybe into next uh september october 2022 because of covid and uh plant shutdowns and supplies and everything else so oh <laughs> it's a difficult time thank you Lord. i appreciate that and i'm glad we are going to be able to get the boats um the item second item now we're into the correspondence. And so the first one is, is item number three, which is the AMO update. And I specifically, uh, there's an item in there and hopefully Rob or Jeanette are on the line here. So um, there's a proposal in there uh, and I'm just gonna read it. It says, there are also proposed amendments to the Planning Act that ministerial zoning orders made under section 47 are not required and are deemed to have never been uh, uh, they never, they would, they had never been uh, that the provincial policy statement would have been deemed not to have applied. So, if I understand that correctly, uh, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, that if an MZO is issued, it does not in any way have to conform to the provincial policy statement. Is that correct? Hi, Mr. Mayor. I, I can speak to that. So. Previously, um, before these changes, it would have to comply um, with, with with the provincial policies. Um, this this particular change, my understanding, was specific to a particular um, development that was taking place in Pickering um, that would impact a wetland, and um, so the change was made that they would not have to comply with the or be consistent with the PPS. So, is it site specific, or does it apply everywhere else in the province? I would have. I would, I would have to look into that. I'm pretty sure it applies everywhere in the province, but it was a direct result of a situation that was taking place in the northern part of the GTA. So if it applies to everywhere in the province, then conceivably somebody could build on a wetland uh, in Selwyn Township if they got an MZO. That's correct, yes. Or they could put an industrial building in a residential subdivision if they got an MZO. Depending on the minister's order, what the request was, yes. Yeah. So basically, the, those orders can have to be consistent with, with, they don't have to be consistent with any planning uh, document. They don't have to be uh, with the provincial policy statement. Do you know if that also applies to the growth plan? No, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to look into it. Um, I, I believe it was a direct reference to the Planning Act or an amendment to the Planning Act, but I would have to actually review the legislation. 
Okay. And this is in, the, in addition to the previous change where uh, conservation authorities uh, could be ordered to issue a permit uh, uh, if an MZO was, uh, was issued. Um, if you could come back to the next meeting just to find out the scope of this, because if it's site specific, that's one thing. If it applies across the province, then, then that's different. And if it applies to just the parent or policy statement, but the growth plan is still in, has to be adhered to, the, the impact would be different again. So uh, I appreciate that. Cherry? And uh, clarification, um, is it the municipality that applies for the MCO or can an applicant do it? Is it both? Well, Typically, oh. yes, yeah, sorry, it is both. Typically, um, what we see that it's the developers that do. Okay, thank you. Just trying to find my list here, sorry. We're now on to, that was uh, three, so we're on to 15, yeah. Correspondence item number 15, I think that's Donna first and then Anita may want to. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, this is related to cannabis again and Health Canada, and it's um, asking for support from the township of Brock. And I just believe that the more that Health Canada hears from as many municipalities as possible that they um, may decide that some of their um, procedures are not working as well as they'd hoped. So I'll, I just did a little summary because there were a lot of whereas's and so on. So um, what it basically is asking, um, require federal licenses and registrations for designated growers to conform with local zoning and control bylaws and ensure that local authorities are informed of any license issuance, amendment, suspension, suspension, reinstatement, or revocation in their area and provide dedicated communication with local governments and police services and provide lawful authority to police agencies to lay charges when licenses exceed what the, um, they're actually issued as and um, provide enforcement support and guidance to local municipalities for dealing with land use complaints relating to cannabis. It's what we've talked about for many months now, but I just think the more times I hear it, the better it would be. Thank you, Donna. And, and just to follow up question to that, um, those are the topics, and this is to staff, those are the topics that the consultation that was announced is going to speak to in which I, I think our intention is to, uh, to input towards. Am I correct in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so the ministry has, has opened up an opportunity as it relates to medical cannabis for, they're looking for input on, uh, on their current uh, provisions. So yeah, these, would be comments in line with I think what we would uh, what we would provide as uh, as an appropriate way forward in terms of changing some of their policies. Thank you. And uh, Anita, did you want to add to that? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Donna was uh, basically speaking along the same lines as um, I was thinking. I think it would be good if we were to support that resolution by the Township of Brock. Um, as they've requested and um, pass it on to whoever. So if Donna wants to move that, I'll second that. You're muted. Move it. All right, Donna moved, Anita second. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, uh, we're on to item number 16. I think that was you again, Donna. Um, 16 and 17 both refer to farm tile drain issues and um, it, it's asking that um, drain plans are that they're filed with the township and I just wanted to ask Rob if we seem to have any issues with farm drain plans 
and that we needed to be concerned about, about this particular problem. No, we've not, uh, we've not had any issues with them. Uh, okay, that's good. Okay, and I think the next item is 8A. That would be you, Sherry. Didn't Donna sorry, have- I went out of order. I've gone out of order, I'm sorry. Didn't Donna have something up for yep. the county? I Yes, I had um, the county official plan project, the one that, I don't know if it's the fourth or fifth one, I'm, I'm just reading from my paper. It focuses on agriculture and rural areas and the provincial map mapping. And it basically talks about um, preserving the land and not doing extra severances but I just wondered, and I don't know if any, either of our members of County Council know this, has there been any discussion about all the property that I hear is being purchased, purchased and um, being used for the cannabis crop? And, and if this continues, then we're going to lose a lot of land to um, food and crop growth. So I just wondered if there was any discussion or if either of you knew that about that. I haven't participated in any discussion specifically on that, uh, but, uh, and I don't know whether Sherry has, Sherry? Uh, I know that um, the township of Asheville Norwood is having a large number of acreage being bought up and um, I think that uh, they're feeling it might be for cannabis growth. And that's one of the reasons that the mayor of Asheville Norwood is going to be bringing a, um, a motion to County Council. Uh, I don't know what the wording is yet, but he gave us notice that something was coming. So I have a feeling it had to do something to do with that, Donna. Thanks, Sherry. If you hear anything, you can just let me know. Okay. Um, I lost you there for a, for a minute. I'm back. That's why I turned off my camera. I'm having internet connections. Um, I, I, didn't, I don't know whether Jeanette or Rob wanted to speak to that at all as part of the, uh, or I guess it's Jeanette that's on the, uh, on the steering committee, whether that discussion has happened in, in, in the context of the official plan. Sorry, um, I was trying to unmute. Thank you. Uh, no, I, we haven't um, had conversations specific to um, cannabis as an agricultural use. There has definitely been discussions, um, sort of the more industrial, like the processing nature of it. Um, I'm sure that as we um, as we kind of go back through the policies, that is something that will will come up. Um, again, um, the Ministry of um, OMAFRA has been on the record as saying that they believe or that it is an agricultural use. Um, so I don't think it's something that would be we would be able to prohibit um, through the official plan um, if that was um, if that was what uh, what councils are thinking. Um, but again, that we haven't had that discussion at this point. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay, um, Mayor um, Mitchell, if 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 I may, because I I still I still dabble in agriculture and I read a lot through and. Uh, a lot of the properties that are being bought up are from land speculation right now too. Right now, the sale of legal marijuana is at the all time low. A lot of companies are going broke or going out of business. The, if the only way you're gonna see anybody plant anything on a field and if they put that much cash in it, it's uh, maybe a little a, a bit of a shyster going on too. And uh, yeah, it's it's not like it's going to be like as Jeanette, Jeanette said. It's going to be industrial. It'll be growing inside. Thank you, Gord. Um, okay, and now we're on to A Day. Sorry, Terry, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, with the speed awareness policy, I in the procedures one and two, I find they're contradictory, and um, because it says that. Complainants, including council members, should be advised to report speeding complaints directly to the OPB. 
And then number two says, complaints that have been directly received by council members or township staff are to be reported to Selwyn staff representatives. So I think we need some clarification there because I find it confusing myself and I know what you're trying to say. So, um, and if uh, we change it, we're going to have to change the recommendation that we've got on our agenda. So Donna, maybe Donna. have some ideas as to how to change it. Donna? Yes, thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Sanis did call me earlier today um, about this issue and I did rewrite number one and two and kind of consolidate the two and I'll read it into the record and and see what people think. So, um, because it was a little cumbersome, I agree. So complaints from the general public, council and someone staff may be reported directly to the OPP or to the Selwyn staff representative on the Smith Ennismore Police Services Board, who will direct them to the OPP, the Smith Ennismore Police Services Board, and the community policing volunteer members so that data collection can take place prior to the next police services board. So this would replace numbers one and two, and we'd have to change the other numbers because we'd be eliminating number one basically and the reason why number one was put in in the first place was that um chris kelly as i'm sorry i don't know his proper um status inspector or whatever really wanted to say in the in the policy that he wants the public to feel comfortable contacting the opp so that's why it was in there in the first place. So um, it's still in there and it includes everybody else. So if that um, is appropriate to everybody, I, I made those changes. For you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, it uh, does clean things up and then the recommendation is going to have to be changed as well because um, what the recommendation was the updated speed awareness policy as endorsed by the police services board and we've now changed it so it would have to say as amended by council from the police services board be approved so i'm okay with what um donna has changed because it does clarify things and if donna would accept the recommendation amended the way i have yes i would accept that uh, I really do not want to bring it back to the police services board because it's been back so many times it's frankly embarrassing so I would be pleased to accept that amendment. So, Jerry you're going to move it and Donna's going to second it right? Yeah you'll have to supply us with the wording that you've uh, made with your change Donna and I'm, I'll supply I'm, sorry sorry what did you say? I said you'll have to supply us with the the changes you've made in the wording and i'll supply you and uh, the clerk with mine angela has the wording so i've already sent it to her okay i don't know if the rest of our colleagues are in agreement Seems colleagues are we okay so jerry's okay and is okay so let's let you move it Donna will second it the clerk's got the wording and uh let's uh all those in favor? Okay, there you. Yeah. okay, that takes care of that one. Very good. Uh, we are now, we have no petitions. We are on portfolio updates, Donna. My goodness, I'm, am I unmuted? You're good. Okay, I'm pretty busy here. Um, so first of all, I'll start with the police services board again. Um, the OPP and the province have asked that um, the OPP detachment board proposal process um, be started and a proposal for a new police services board structure be submitted by June the 7th of 2021 
And basically what they want is um, one police services board per detachment. So that will mean um, fewer council representations on the board, um, probably fewer public and provincial as well, because I think they, they set a ruling of approximately 14 members per board and that covers six or seven municipalities. I'm not just sure. I know Cav and Monaghan are out of the OPP. So it covers quite a few municipalities. So it will be quite a watered down board. And Janice has already started the proposal with um, CEOs and heads of council and Peterborough County. So, and I, con I was in contact with um, Chris Galeazza and he's aware of this too. He's spoken with Janice. So I, I think the process is in the works. Any questions on that? Uh, and we had our library board meeting this afternoon. Um, and we decided again that this year we would do, I'm not sure if I told you this before, we're doing the same thing for the volunteer recognition, purchasing $20 restaurant, um, sell one restaurant gift cards and sending them to the volunteers in the mail for in place of the June dinner. And we're also sending gift cards for the um, years of service recognition because this is two years now that we have not had a June dinner. And if we're able to have it in 2022, the recognition awards would be far too long. So that's what we're doing there. And we started to discuss um, our truth and reconciliation process and how it's going to look for the library. And um, rec, I don't have anything to report, Jerry May. And the link, I believe, is starting May the 6th. And there's a photo op next Wednesday morning in front of the Tragically Hip or uh, Hendron's Funeral Home. Maybe that's a bad choice of a place. Um, but I think it's just going to be me, myself there, because other council members were invited and had conflicts. So. For that particular photo op, I think it will just be me, and that's all. And, and just to add to that, Donna, at some point, uh, I think it's I think the start up is May the third. Angie, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, that that's correct. Yeah, it's third. This is an opportunity because I think uh, one of the, the local paper wants to get a picture of it. Once this is up and running, and we're through, hopefully. Uh, uh, we're into a, a, an area where the COVID restrictions are less. We'll do a full council uh, opportunity for, for everybody to come together and, and to celebrate this along with our partners. So uh, it's just, uh, this is probably not the, the ideal time to do that. Hopefully by May the 3rd, things will be Okay, thank you, Donna. And uh, we are now on to economic development. Jerry. Yes. Um before I begin, uh, Mr. Chair, did we have a mover and seconder for the consent items? No, we didn't. Do you think we ought to do that? <laughs> I do too, thank you. Anita and Donna, all those in favor? There we go. Thank you, Sherry. No worries. Um, okay, so my, my report's a bit long. Um, we're expecting a building permit application very soon for the first of three apartment complexes planned at the Lilacs development. Each apartment complex will include 20 units. Two plans of subdivision are expected to be filed soon, both in Lakefield. One plan will include 966 units with a combo of single family dwellings and townhouses and mixed use lower commercial slash upper residential. And the other plan is for 16 units townhouse type. Full details will be given once the plans are complete. Robin Jenkins, I'm sure 
you all know, but I'll mention it, is the owner of Lakeville Flowers and Gifts on Queen Street, has put an offer to buy the 160-year-old stone house on Bridge Street for conversion to a combined flower shop, plant store, and garden center. The sale closes March 29th. I was in to see the almost finished product at Hybrid Sports, the site of the old Rona building on Shimon. They totally revamped the inside of the building. It's amazing. You should um, make an effort to go out and have a look at what they've done there. It does not look like the inside of a Rona building anymore. They will offer two full-size basketball slash volleyball courts, a small turf field, a fitness area, and change rooms. And phase two will include two structures, an air-supported structure with turf fields. The owner has interested parties chomping at the bit to get started with sports. Haley's Hidden Treasures is now open on Queen Street. She's in the Celtic uh, Connection building and offers retro products. The Loon was doing a booming business on Queen Street um, on their outdoor patio on Sunday. Sunfish, a cannabis store in Lakefield, is slated to open in April. The owner of the Lakefield Bakery has plans to open a new bakery in Bob Cajun and keep the one in Lakefield. Orca was oversubscribed for seedlings sold. There were orders from 99 residents who ordered 11,375 trees. So I have an update for CIP. Overstock Liquidators has um, received a grant for installation of an air purification system. Sullivan's General Store has received a grant for facade improvement and ground sign. And the sign is going to be on the front and side of the building as well as out front along the road and a new automatic door and windows. Sunblockers has received a grant for the installation of an accessible front door mechanism, HEPA uh, filtration system and sen sensor lights in the change rooms. So uh, the, I believe Angela can uh, can confirm or no, but I believe that um, we're, are we oversubscribed for the CIP now, Angie, or do we still have money available? Uh, we, we're we definitely getting close to being oversubscribed. Uh, we have a lot of interest in the program, which is great. So when we get a little bit closer, we can definitely let council know where we're at. And then if council wishes to, they can uh, make some decisions about whether they want to continue with the program as is or put some more money into it. Okay, thank you very much. And that's my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, then we'll move on to Public Works and Recreation. Uh, Jerry. Yes, sir, thank you. Um, so the roads seem to be holding up well. Um, now the frost isn't all out of them, but um, so far so good. Um, the boys have been um, cleaning out some ditches and they've started to sweep and brush. And as I understand it, it's Lakefield and it's more Bridge North this year. Um, and then North Smith, South Smith, I believe. Um, so that uh, that sort of gives you guys a heads up. It's also available on the virtual town hall on who is um, who is uh, in which order. Uh, so let me get to Michael here. Um, as far as the parks and rec go, the full-time staff are getting all the facilities cleaned, um, painted and tidied up throughout the township. There's no facility um, rentals allowed until we um, until we leave the red zone. Um, they're still working with the youth organizations, which is important, um, and the PPH to uh, see what field use will look like. So they're developing plans here to, to make sure that if we if things are a go, we're ready for it. And unlike last year, too, uh, none of the groups have canceled just yet, which I think is a good sign that um, they think that's going to be going. And love Mike XOXO. Oh, shouldn't have read that. Done. Bye. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Anita. Sustainability, Culture, and Senior Services. Uh, yeah, so the uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee and the Municipal Heritage Committee will be meeting later this week. Um, as uh, one of the things that uh, at the Heritage Committee, we will once again be discussing the Heritage Register, which will come to council at some point, as well as a, a policy uh, for discussion at some point. 
As Sherry mentioned, um, 44 Bridge Street has been conditionally sold. They apparently received multiple offers. Um, and as Sherry points out, it will expand into a flower shop, plant store and garden center. Um, I know this isn't in our township, but uh, the, the province has announced uh, um, 224 new long-term care spaces for a new building in Peterborough, which is at the corner of Woodland and Water Street, which is close enough to uh, Selwyn Township that could almost be in our township. I'm sure Andy will speak to that a little bit more. <clears throat> um, as you may have heard, Empress is back in Outbreak, which is where I work. Um, so we're getting swabbed every three days um, until we um, are cleared. Um, I do once again have a question for you, Andy, with regards to uh, the last I heard, there were 813 total confirmed cases of COVID-19. Um, of those, 106, 156 are presumed to involve a variant of concern. My question is, how long does it take before they say, yes, it is an actual variant of concern or that it just becomes like the original COVID-19? Um, because it's these uh, presumed variants. Um, I know we have one actual variant of concern in the health unit jurisdiction. I'm just wondering how long it takes before these 156, which are presumed, um, are actual identified either one way or the other. Uh, let me just try to answer that. And I'm just, I'm not in any way an expert on this. I'm gonna to try to repeat Rosanna's answer because she was asked that question. So essentially the screening is, 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 is pretty accurate. It, if they screen it as a variant of concern, it in all probability is a variant of concern. They then do have a further test, usually at, at one point it was 14 days, that would determine by doing a genome, genome sequencing exactly which of the variants it would be. Uh, with the increase in testing across the province and increase in, in cases, the emphasis has been on that as opposed to doing the follow-up genome sequencing. So uh, that may take longer, but from what Rosanna has said is that if the initial screening is that it's a variant of concern in all likelihood, that's what it is. And, and uh, they will, uh, they have to sequence the genome to know exactly which variant it is. That's, uh, that, that's the way she answered the question at the press conference on Thursday. So uh, that's your report. I'll go into my report then. A uh, few things here. So first of all, you probably heard Eorn uh, made their announcement this past week on their cell uh, gap uh, project. Uh, they announced $300 million to uh, improve uh, cell service in Eastern Ontario, including in our area. Uh, that's $150 million uh, investment from Rogers, who is the, is the preferred uh, partner and uh, uh, about $150 million from the two senior levels of government over a number of years. So that, that was a, a, a big announcement that was made uh, last week. Uh, Eorn also announced that they've applied under the UBC, I think it's called, the, the, uh, the, the broadband, the Universal Broadband Fund, uh, that they put an application uh, forward for what they call their one gig project which is to get uh, better high-speed uh, uh, service, uh, again, through Eastern Ontario, but in our area as well. Uh, this week and this month is, is, uh, is, uh, is March for Meals, and it's a highlight for community care for their Meals on Wheels programs and the great work that they do in our township in, in assisting uh, their clients with Meals on Wheels. Uh, in terms of ORCA, uh, ORCA has... Uh, approved their and incorporated the new governance changes that the province put forward in its legislation in Bill 6. And so they have now been incorporated into our bylaws. And uh, the board also decided that uh, uh, as uh, the province would, should the province issue an MZO uh, and order ORCA to issue a permit, that it would be the board's executive committee who would actually issue the uh, issue it. So it's not something that is delegated to staff as, as most of our permits are. Uh, we are, uh, as Rob mentioned in the answer to your question 
earlier that we will be participating uh, in the cannabis cons consultation that the, that um, that has been put forward by Health Canada. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of public health, uh, it has been uh, it has been a real changing target. So uh, as you know, uh, uh, the uh, we had experienced a significant increase in our cases uh, as a result of uh, of an incident uh, our, our cases uh, have uh, are a little bit less this week than they were last week we'll have to see where we uh, where we end up uh, on the week uh, most of the attention right now is on the vaccination side and so um, a, a number of things were put in place last week including uh, the provincial booking system went live on the 15th. It, uh, our, our mass vaccination clinics opened and uh, we, uh, in our area, we were dealing with uh, 80 plus and that we had anticipated that that's what we would be dealing with until the first work week of April because that had been the initial plan. As you probably are aware, the province changed on Friday. Late on Friday afternoon, they opened it up uh, to the next tranche down, which is 75 to 79. Uh, and so folks are trying to, to address that because it brings a whole set of new people into the system that had been expected to come into the system a little later. Right now, uh, the, the max vaccination clinics, from the latest information I have, are booked through to the 28th. Uh, and uh, what they do is as uh, as a new uh, vaccine comes into the community or is committed to come into the community, then they will add additional uh, ad additional uh, booking opportunities for the period after the after the 28th. Uh, so there's been uh, there's been a there's been a big take up as one would expect, and that's a very positive thing. The more people who get vaccinated, the more uh, we reach what they refer to as herd immunity. And so that's a that's a that's a positive thing. Um, the province also have put forward a couple of other uh, proposals. Um, they um, they a week ago, a week and a half ago, started a pilot project in three areas where pharmacies would be distributing vaccine. That was using AstraZeneca for from for sixty to sixty four. But one of the other changes was uh, that they changed the advice. So that AstraZeneca could be administered to people older than 64, and so the province is going to follow that guideline, and also that they will expand the uh, the areas where pharmacies will be uh, uh, distributing vaccine. That's going to take them a couple of weeks to get that rolled out. So uh, uh, I don't have any confirmation of how many may be. Uh, distributing in our particular area. But right now it's the three pilots uh, that, the, that, they, that they had put in place. The other one is uh, using in our particular area, the pilot that we, uh, that we um, undertook was to have our primary care providers providing the uh, supply of AstraZeneca and uh, that, uh, and they were administering uh, to their patients they started between 60 and 64, and they, they can respond to the older amount. Um, uh, how that, whether, how and whether that will continue, I, I, I'm not aware of yet on, on what they've decided on that. And clearly part of that is going to depend on, on how much AstraZeneca comes into our particular, our particular area. So there are a number of, there are a number of different, uh, there are a number of different, uh, uh, initiatives underway. Uh, and uh, there are uh, large numbers of vaccine coming into the country now, and in turn coming to Ontario and in turn, will be coming down to uh, will be coming down to, uh, to our community. So it's, uh, it's a, I use this phrase in, 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 in a press conference the other day, it's a Herculean task. Uh, I'm told it's the largest mass vaccination effort in Canadian history. And uh, and uh, we're well into it. Uh, we're well into it right now. Um, the a couple of other things I just wanted to mention uh, is I had an opportunity 
uh, to attend uh, the uh, Peterborough Chamber's Power Hour, where they had the, uh, the warden and the, and the mayor of Peterborough and the MP and the MPP speak to a number of issues. And so that was interesting. Uh, and um, the tomorrow, uh, the provincial budget is supposed to be tabled. So we'll have to stand by and and see what uh, impact, uh, if any, that will have on the on the township. I'm sure Lane will be listening very intently uh, to uh, to the budget speech. And uh, the uh, just wanted to mention we continue to be in the process, and, and Sherry is very much in the center of this uh, the service delivery review that's uh, that's taking place at the at the county. And uh, there were no, we've made already made some changes, and there's there's more to come. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate what uh, what Anita had said, uh, uh, Trent is uh, the way if it's going to work is going to lease land to a, a private company who has received licenses to create the long term care beds in the the the, the, the lot, if I could call it that, is is immediately adjacent to our township. So it's at the it's the north. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. The northwest corner of of, uh, of that intersection, it, so woodland and and, uh, and water. So it's the northwest corner. That's right. I think it's the northwest corner. Yes, it is the northwest corner. And of course, there are services that come up right to that area. So they'll have to bring the services across the street. I would I would assume. So that's uh, that's my report. Sorry for for for. Uh, for taking so long, I should mention because I know there's lots of questions about public health. Uh, there will be a press conference uh, at 11 o'clock on Thursday, and uh, the, I'm, I'm sure that there will be uh, more information as as if, if folks try to uh, try to keep up with uh, with all the changes. So, anyways, thank you, colleagues, for listening. Um, we now need to go on to item number 11. We have a special meeting that is being planned for May the 13th. This is the Cannabis Best Practices Review and, and, and recommendations. Uh, uh, Angie, did you wanna to speak to this at all? Or Rob, I don't know who's leading this. So. It, it's really just to establish the, uh, the special meeting date. Uh, I think every member of council was available that date and time. Okay, you need a mover and a seconder then. We've got a needed to move it and uh, and uh, Donna to second it. All in favor of establishing that special meeting, that is carried. Okay, we will now go into the bylaw section. Uh, so we have uh, the bylaw in respect of 1824-8 flying, that's the polished perfection. We have the uh, the authorizing the Genet Tender Award, uh, Supply Point Incorporated, the MOU regarding the curbside garbage collection extension and the MVA uh, policy that, that Gord presented to us and the, uh, the service uh, contract with the city of Peterborough for the rural bus service. So we're gonna have a motion for all of those. Anita, seconded by Donna, all those in favor, Terry, uh, for the confirming bylaw. We have a Sherry seconded by Jerry, all those in favor. And for uh, adjournment, Jerry, seconded by Anita, all in favor. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, it's a good meeting. And uh, Jerry, thank you for uh, chairing the, that very lengthy committee of adjustment. Uh, did that very efficiently. Thank you very much. And uh, to all the staff, thank you. So have a good evening, everybody. Thanks.